Hello, and welcome to the evolution of Bottle and Bond here at BCB. Uh, we know this looks a lot different than what we planned to originally, but we're so excited to be able to join you virtually. Uh, my name is Lynn House, and I am the National Spirits Specialist and Portfolio Mixologist for Heaven Hill Distillery. I am super excited to be joined with my cohort in arms, uh, Bernie Lovers, who is our global whiskey ambassador. Today we're going to be talking about uh, Bottled and Bond, its history, as well as its prevalence in cocktails of past and cocktails of today. Thank you, Lynn. And this is Bernie Lovers, the global whiskey ambassador. But you know me as the whiskey professor, probably. And this is my favorite subject, uh, Bottled and Bond. I have the tattoo. I love talking about Bottled and Bond. We're going to learn about why it came about how it evolved through the decades up to present time. And I just, uh, even though it's virtual, I still can't wait to go on this journey with you to uh, talk about my favorite subject, Bottle and Bond. Let's first start about why did the Bottle and Bond Act come to be? Why, why did we even need it? Well, back in the late 1800s, you had folks that uh, owned their own bars. I, for a matter of fact, my grandfather owned a saloon here in downtown Louisville at 16th Street and Walnut Street. And behind the bar would look different than your bars today. There were bottles behind the bar. There weren't a lot of spirits that were uh, straight whiskeys that came, that came uh, that were bottled. We didn't start to bottle whiskey until after the Bottle and Bond Act, and not just because the word bottle is in it. <laughs> it's just, there's a reason. Uh, straight whiskey, which was not a legal term back then, meant that it came straight from the barrel. So that was a purer form of whiskey in people's minds. Then there was compound or imitation whiskeys. Now they were put into bottles because they were not aged. They were just uh, compounded or manufactured. Here's a recipe for a compound or imitation whiskey. See, it says how to make imitation whiskeys such as old rye, old rye mangahila, and bourbon. You can make either bourbon or rye with this recipe. Okay? You take 20 gallons of proof spirit, neutral grain spirits. You dilute it to 100 proof. You add five gallons of pure bourbon, one pint of simple syrup, one ounce of spirits of nitra, and some uh, some uh, caramel for color, some burnt sugar, or you know caramel, but burnt sugar for coloring. Well, there you go, boom! Instantly, you got you got rye or bourbon. You just call it. So, if you walked into a saloon, that saloon could have made that recipe and just bottled it in those bottles. Uh, you really had no idea, or you know, you you didn't. There wasn't a lot to trust uh, back then. Uh, and then if you did drink straight whiskey, it came straight from the barrel. So they either had the barrels behind the bar, pyramided behind the bar, or they had it in the back room. And when you ordered, let's say, an old crow, which would have been around back then, you would have uh, taken that, they would have taken that uh, an empty bottle, which they had, and they filled it up, either in front of you, right from the spigot of the barrel, or they'd go in the back room and, and fill it up there too. Of course, that could be tampered with because you could add water to that barrel and get more whiskey out of it, but lowering the proof. So that was kind of a, a one reason why it came about because people were either making their own whiskeys or tampering with it. Then there was another faction over in Illinois. In Peoria, Peoria Illinois, there was a gentleman named Charles Clark, and he was the head of and started the Whiskey Trust. And the Whiskey Trust was, you know, back then the monopolies were, were legal. So they were trying to just corner the market, the whiskey market. And they, they would kind of um, strong arm you into joining the Whiskey Trust. Uh, you can see here in the article that there were some dynamite charges at a Chicago distillery that were set off. You know, if you didn't join their distillery, their, 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 uh, their Whiskey Trust, they would dynamite your distillery or or set fire to it or do you know try to get you to you know say hey if you don't do this we're going to burn you down or blow you up and they at the one point they they in the late 1800s they controlled 80 percent of the country's distribution uh supply and distribution of whiskey uh this was in illinois 
So it was further away from the distilleries in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Kentucky. So, and they, they, they didn't have as much rule over those. But that was a big reason too that, uh, that the folks in Kentucky, uh, they had an ally in Washington, and that is this gentleman right here. That is John Carlisle. He was from Covington, Kentucky, which is right across the river from Cincinnati. And he was important because he was the Secretary of Treasury of the United States. And different distillers, they wanted to have a rule, laws or rules passed uh, to show that they had something that was more quality than the other whiskeys. So, you know, those compound or imitation whiskeys that had been the basically whiskey flavored vodka. So they lobbied for, and uh, John Carlisle was important because as Secretary of Treasury of the United States, his agents actually lived on the distilleries because they're the ones that checked those warehouses and levied the taxes. And they actually lived on the, on the distillery property. So it wasn't a big leap, you know, they already had people in place. This wasn't gonna be something that was really gonna be hard to roll out because the, the, the Treasury agents were still there already there. So in uh, March 3rd, 1897, they passed the very first consumer protection legislation in the history of the United States, the Bottled and Bond Act of 1897. And you see that green tax strip right there. Now there's a reason to bottle whiskey and they had to have that green tax strip on it. And here are the laws that were passed on March 3rd, 1897, to make bond a thing. Came into being, another fun fact is on March 4th, 1897, is when John Carlisle left office. So he took it right to the finish line. I think that's really cool uh, about this situation too. I describe bottle and bonds and words on labels like Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey, which have laws now, but they didn't have laws for those particular designations back then. So bottle and bond was very important. It also was a way to put off paying taxes. You didn't have to pay taxes on the whiskey until you brought it out of bond. Before that, you had to pay taxes as it came off the still. So that meant when it went in the barrel, you'd already pay taxes on it. You're actually paying um, the, the for the angel share. So it really wasn't fair how that was set up. This was a way to, to, to make it a little more fair, but also to delay the taxes if you had overproduction. It had to come from one distillery. It had to come from one distilling season. The whiskey that was produced had to come from one distilling season. They set up two seasons, a spring season, January through June, and a fall season, which was July through December. It had to be exactly 100 degrees of proof. And that's where bottle and bond comes in. It's always 100 proof. It's never 101 or 99.9. It's always 100. And to get it down to bottling strength of 100 from what you barreled it at, you could only add pure water. It had to be aged in wooden containers for a minimum of four years. So right there, you're guaranteed a purity, pure water only, a good age, minimum four years, and a good strength of 100 proof. So just think how important that would be to going from whiskeys that had all those additives to it and really did start out as whiskey, started out as neutral grain spirits, and now you're guaranteed purity, age, and strength. And that is why bottle and bomb was so important and still is important today. Of course, the Whiskey Trust and the different folks that were making compound whiskeys they didn't like this law being passed. So even after 1897, when it was passed, they were fighting and they were lobbying for it to be struck down. And so this is when President Taft, he, he made a decision and it's called the Taft decision. And it is the next watershed moment for American whiskey and for spirits. And in 1906, he further classified whiskeys as a, a straight product, okay? So straight became a, 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 a legal term, and it also was an age statement. So bottle and bond is aged for a minimum of four years, straight whiskeys aged for a minimum of two years, and then some 
pure water only. And then he also classified that it had, if it had neutral grain spirits in the whiskey, it must list that on the package. And that's still the law today. So there's the two, that's the next, that's kind of the exclamation point on the Bottle and Bond Act. And then of course, remember the movie, The Jerk, okay, with Steve Martin? Remember when he gets his name in the phone book? Yeah, if you haven't seen that movie, it's one of my favorite little movies. If I see it on, I have to watch it. And Steve Martin, you know, he gets his name in the phone book when he gets a phone number, his own phone number. And he says, Johnson, name and R, page 72. This is the type of advertising that makes you, good things are gonna happen to me now. And then of course his life kind of, it kind of went to uh, hit, hit the skids a little bit, you know? So here we had these great laws. We had the Bottle and Bond Act of 1897, the Taft decision of uh, the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. And we thought good things are gonna happen to us now. And that's when just a few years later in January of 1920, we had prohibition. And now Lynn House is gonna make us a cocktail that would have been around at this time, right after the Bottle and Bond Act of 1897 was passed and the Pure Food and Drug Act with the Taft decision uh, right around the same time. Uh, we're going to we have good laws happening and she's gonna make a cocktail with one of my favorite spirits and hopefully one of yours, uh, Mellow Corn. Where's my children of the corn out there? So Lynn, I can't wait to see what you're coming up with for Mellow Corn. So as Bernie mentioned during this time, corn whiskey was huge. We don't quite have a surge in bourbon yet. Um, so it would be very, very common to have corn whiskey bottled and bond products out there. So I'm excited to present this first cocktail, which is gonna be a mellow corn whiskey sour. Uh, we know in Jerry Thomas's book that was released um, in the late 1800s, the Bon Vivant, the bartender's guide, that whiskey sours were part of the fancy cocktail um, story. Um, it was a man's cocktail, so this would be a cocktail that a lot of people would have been enjoying at the time. And so I'm happy to present to you the Mellow Corn Whiskey Sour. So for our first cocktail that we're gonna do today, utilizing bottled and bond spirits, is going to be a Mellow Corn Whiskey Sour. The reasons why, if you look as to how people were drinking back in the late 1890s, early 1900s, there was still a lot of corn whiskey, not bourbon, not rye, that was being enjoyed. So we're gonna use mellow corn. We also know that people were enjoying a lot of whiskey sours. That was a man's cocktail coming out of the sailor um, kind of environment. And uh, in Jerry Thomas's book, The Bon Vivant, The Bartender's Guide, he actually gives the first early recipes of whiskey sours that were somewhat elevated. They were considered fancy cocktails. So what we're gonna do for this cocktail, the first thing is it's an extra fancy cocktail. So we need to add the white of one egg. So essentially one ounce of egg white. It's a sour, so it has to have a citrus element to it. That citrus element was really important because that citrus was a way for our soldiers to prevent contracting scurvy when they were out in the high seas. So we're just gonna put a half ounce of fresh squeezed lemon juice in here. Now we're building a sour, a cocktail always needs some sort of a sweet element to it. So we've got pure cane syrup. So this is a simple syrup that I made with cane sugar as opposed to bleached white sugar. Because if we're looking back in the day, they would have had bleached white sugar, they would have had cane sugar. So equal parts of sugar and water melted together. We're gonna to do a half ounce of that. And that's my cane syrup that I'm putting in. And then of course the corn whiskey and with the bottle of bond category, we're gonna utilize mellow corn, uh, four years aged, obviously because of law, 100 proof, aged in used barrels. This is 80% corn. So there's gonna be a lot of really great sweet kind of butterscotch notes and such coming from the mellow corn. We're gonna give this a nice, what we call a dry shake, and that's just shaking with that ice. And the reason why I'm doing that is because there is no, there is no, there is egg white in here. And we want the egg white to integrate, to dissolve. Um, it's very much like making a, a salad dressing. You want it all to emulsify. Next, 
thing we're doing is just adding some ice. Because obviously we need the dilution and we need the chill factor. So I'll recap my tin and give it a really good hearty shake. What we're doing during this period is just um, diluting the cocktail, emulsifying the ingredients, and creating a really nice meringue inside of our tins. So I'm going to continue to shake for a couple of seconds. I can kind of hear the timber change, and I can feel on the outside of the tin that cocktail is just at a really great temperature. I'm going to slowly strain my cocktail into, I've got this great vintage classic cocktail ware that comes from about the 1920s. Some really nice Art Deco stuff. And you can see a beautiful biscuit starts to develop on top. And every cocktail needs a little bit of a bitter added to it. That bitter is kind of the salt and pepper to the cocktail. Just helps bring all the ingredients together. So I have some beautiful colonial bitters. So these would have been spices that would have been prevalent during the time. Simply drip it on top. And then I'm going to do what we call a feather. Is I just take a little skewer and strain it through the drips to create a really beautiful design on top. And there we have our mellow corn sour. Cheers and stay bonded. So even though the producers of the whiskey, the distillers, could not make, uh, produce, manufacture, transport, sell whiskey in prohibition, there were a few licenses granted, six to be exact, that could sell whiskey but sell it as medicine, medicinal. So they could use the stocks that were made before prohibition and they sold them in pint bottles and they were all bottled in bond. So further showing the public, which had to be of course educated of what the Bottle and Bond Act was after it was passed in 1897, going into the 1900s and the Pure Food and Drug Act, you know, they, they advertised those as their products when they were bottled in bond and they did follow the rules of the Pure Food and Drug Act, they advertised that. So people got to know that bottled in bond and straight whiskeys were the good stuff. And especially during prohibition, the medicine, medicinal bottles of whiskey they were able to purchase for when they had a breakout of, of illness in the family. You know, there's one of the actual, here's a picture of one of the actual prescriptions that were filled out uh, this particular lady, I, I hope she pulled through. Um, you know, the doctor, you know, God, think about how much they had to make up, you know, why this person was sick. And really, it's just an excuse for people who had money and means to be able to get whiskey, right? Rich people are always taken care of by the, by, by, you know, if you have money, you can get things. But, uh, uh this lady, um, uh, Carrie Augusta, she, she was uh, so sick, the doctor prescribed, um, uh, whiskey. Uh, wine, wine glass full thrice daily. I sure hope she put, pulled through, you know, so, but these people got to know because this is on an official government document. This is the good stuff. It said bottled in bond on the box. Uh, and because the medicine came, the bottles came individually boxed in these, in these, uh, boxes of, of medicinal whiskeys. So people got to know in their heads, bottled in bond is quality, bottle and bond is the good stuff. Okay? And so after prohibition is over, December 5th, 1933, it took a while because it's the government, you know, it took a while to, to put those laws down again, because you know, there's no laws on, on, on the only thing we had was bottled and bond and the Pure Food and Drug Act, and those all go away when you can't make whiskey for 14 years almost. So in April of 1936, this is when they come out and they write down the laws and they pass these laws. It's, it classifies whiskey. It classifies what straight whiskey is. It classifies rye whiskey and wheat whiskey and bourbon whiskey, it, malt whiskey. It puts down these laws of what those whiskeys are. And it started uh, the, this evolution 
of what these laws will be uh, from then and built on into the future. We also had to put a tax strip on every bottle. And just like they, those medicinal whiskeys did, and it told you a lot of information. Not only does the label tell you something, and I'm always one preaching, you've got to know how to read a label. If you, got to, if you know what the laws of, of, of whiskey is, bourbon or rye or corn whiskey, and the word straight, and then the state of designation, the words bottled in bond, they all mean things. They're like, they're like military men and women earning medals. If you're an expert marksman in your unit, uh, you are so designated by a medal you wear on your chest and you wear that with pride. And that's what we do when we earn the, the right to call a whiskey straight. It's been aged for two years and has nothing but pure water. We can wear that metal with pride on our labels, on our chest. Uh, so we have that. On the tax strip, it had extra information. So it told you the exact, um, the exact season that it was produced. It told you the exact season and year when it was bottled, you could just look at these tax strips and see how old this whiskey is by doing the math. A green tax strip was always bottled in bond. It had the picture there of John Carlisle in the middle uh, because he was the Secretary of Treasury, so that would be on top of the bottle there. It had to have the name of the distillery and it changed over the years. You can see the evolution of how these tax strips uh, had to have different information on them. The red tax strip you see there was everything else that was not bottled in bond. So if it was 86 proof or 90 proof or 101 proof or 107 proof, that was not bottled in bond. So, the, and you could also be in a liquor store and just look at the tops of the bottles and know which one's bottled in bond just by that green tax strip. It was really something to see. Uh, and of course, this all ended in 1985. Uh, it was a lot, as you can imagine, uh, bottling every bottle and having to put a tax strip on top of it is, is, is kind of tough for the distilleries. It's even tough now on our old Fitzgerald. You'll see that tax strip on there on the decanter series. But we do it because that's a, you know, that's a, that's a special product. And of course, um, you know, back then, whiskey was $5 a bottle. So it was extra work. Uh, for the silver. So just an interesting uh, look into the history of bottled and bond and that tax strip was on there. Bottled and bond became what if you if you had a bottled and bond product, then that that kind of that kind of legitimized your 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 line and legitimized your distillery. You worked for those for that for that uh, for that designation. When it's just bottled and bond, you didn't just earn a medal, you had all the medals. Right? So I, uh, you have all the badges. I describe bottled and bond spirits as the green beret of spirits, the green beret of whiskey. It has all the medals. That's why I would think you want every single bottle and bond because it had all the medals, all the badges. Um, here was Heaven Hill's first bottled and bond bourbon, Old Heaven Hill. And you see there on the right, uh, can, you, can you see that's a screenshot from a movie? and he's holding that bottle. That is Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump, and that's what you will see him drinking uh, a lot of Heaven Hill throughout that, throughout that movie, and that would have been correct uh, because of the time up in the Northeast in New York and Massachusetts and Rhode Island and Connecticut, that would have been a, a, a very big brand in the late, uh, in the late in, during the Vietnam War and post-Vietnam War. But that was our first bottled in bond. And so we waited until 1939 to come out with our very first bottle and bomb because we, we distilled and bar barreled our first bourbon on December 13th, 1935. So we had to wait four years, but we did so because we wanted to come out with that green beret, that Navy seal of spirits and whiskey. Then, as it's coming out and we had prohibition, we thought, well, you know, again, good things are going to happen to us now, right? Well, it doesn't always work that way because whiskey had been gone, American whiskey had been gone so long. And because we did have to wait four years, our competitors got a four-year head start on us. Imagine, you know, the, the uh, running a race and they, they, the starter's pistol goes off and you got to wait, you know, four seconds 
or four minutes before you start the race. Well, that's kind of the, the what happened with, with us. We, we could make whiskey, but we had to distill it, barrel it, and wait four years to come out. So our competitors from Scotland, who made blended Scotch whiskey, they, uh, they didn't have prohibition. So they had aged stocks ready to go on December 6th, 1933. Also our neighbors from the north in Canada, they had aged stocks because they did not have prohibition the same time that we did. So they were ready to go. They were ready to rock and roll. And boy, those whiskeys flowed into the United States and just, just with an avalanche and just a tidal wave of whiskeys that washed over the rye and bourbon and American whiskey. And as our owner, Max Shapiro would say, almost sent us to the great liquor store in the sky. But still, great establishments did know the importance of bottled and bond. Here is the original cocktail menu for the new Monteleone Hotel in New Orleans. This is nine years before they, called, they, they made the carousel bar. This is the original cocktail list. It is a great glimpse into history of what's happening. This is the price in cents. So as you can see, you know, 30 cents, 40 cents uh, for a drink, 50, 55 cents for the high-end uh, imports. Uh, that you can look at that cocktail list. You know, look at on there. Look at all those drinks on there. Hey, the first three are brandy drinks. Then you've got an Alexander. Again, it's like it's like the brandy, ball and bond brandy was big back then. Then you've got the Manhattan, of course. You've got all the different drinks, fizzes, and you've got uh, you've got the mixed drinks and punches. It's all there. But look at the bottom left is your miscellaneous whiskeys, and top right, bonded whiskeys, and then your Scotch whiskeys underneath that. Look at those bonded whiskeys. They have their own section. They are proudly designated as bonded whiskeys. And look at the prices. They are at a premium to the miscellaneous whiskeys and equal or even more premium than the imported Scotch whiskeys. That's how important bottle and bond whiskeys were at the, at the Monteleone Hotel in 1940. So that's why if you're putting together a cocktail list, if you're putting together a spirits list, and you wanna be authentic and historic, and that's why I love, of course we all know that we all like uh, making cocktails with bottle and bond because that higher proof stands up in the cocktail as Lynn has been showing us uh, in, in the cocktail. Um, that is why we love the bottle and bond spirit so much. So after that original Hotel Monteleone cocktail list, a Manhattan, of course, is on that list. And of course, a Manhattan would have been on everybody's cocktail list. Everybody, you know, just like the old fashioned, everybody has a way of making a Manhattan. And Lynn's gonna show us uh, with a great spirit that was just being launched right around that time in 1940 when the Monteleone was, was opened up. Uh, and she's gonna show us her Manhattan with Rittenhouse Rye. So as Bernie mentioned, you know, the Manhattan was the cocktail of the age most recognizably as a rye cocktail initially, and Rittenhouse rye was available in Bottle and Bond during the 1940s, as well as Dubonnet Rouge, which the domestic version had just been launched in the United States in the 1940s. So this little twist on a cocktail that he could have enjoyed back at that time is going to be a 50-50 Manhattan. So that's gonna be an equal split between Rittenhouse rye, Bottle and Bond, and Dubonnet Rouge with a little bit of aromatic orange bitters because of course that sweet spirit, water and bitters is the true definition of a cocktail. So here we are in the evolution of Bottle and Bond where in the 1940s prohibition has been repealed and we're looking at the cocktails that people were enjoying and doing little kind of fun riffs on it. So what we know um, was that Rittenhouse Rye was first released in 1939 and be became a popularity in the 1940s. Manhattan was a huge cocktail, as Bernie has talked about at the Monteleon and various hotels and restaurants, traditionally with a sweet vermouth as its um, modifier that you mix with. But also in the 1940s, Dubonnet was released, which was another wine-based aperitif. So what we're gonna do for a cocktail that you would enjoy during this period of time is a 50-50 Manhattan. So I'm gonna take, first and foremost, my wine-based aperitif, this Dubonnet. 
And I'm going to do an ounce and a half of it. This is a very spirit forward cocktail. And so that's why we're going to stir it and not shake it because we don't want over dilution. And then I'm going to take my Rittenhouse rye and I'm just going to do equal portions. As I said, this is a 50 50 Manhattan. So an ounce and a half of that Rittenhouse rye. So beautiful bottle and bond rye whiskey. We're going to in our mixing glass, add some ice. And we're going to give this a nice stir. We're stirring for dilution. We're stirring for integration of ingredients. I like to sing happy birthday to myself, and that's about the time that I feel that you've given a cocktail a great stir. And so the basis of a cocktail, obviously, is spirit, sugar, water, bitter. We've got the spirit with the written house. We've got some of the sweet with the Dubonnet, we've got the water with the ice, but we need to add that bitter. And with rye whiskey in particular, I always find that orange bitters are a nice compliment. So I add that right at the very end and just give it one last delicate stir. Reason why I choose to do that is because I don't want to blow off the flavors. So we're gonna take our strainer, and we're gonna slowly Strain this into a really great piece of vintage glassware that I have from the 1940s. I like my Manhattans served up personally. And then I have some Luxardo cherries. You can use a brandy cherry. You can make your own cherries. You can use fresh cherries. And then just have that as a delicate garnish to finish it off. And cheers. So here's our Rittenhouse Dubonnet 5050 Manhattan. So we pick up the evolution of bottled and bond with World War II. So World War II breaks out and the government needed the different companies to provide uh, different materials for the war effort. They recruited and got, demanded, used the uh, Production Act to have the distilleries produce high proof alcohol for the war effort. And when you, I don't know the, I don't know all the, uh, the technology and the science behind it, but you can make uh, synthetics for parachutes and uh, different uh, items that you need from high proof alcohol. So from 1941 to 1945, right when we got back, remember Heaven Hill, we made our first, we, we, we sold our first bottles of, of whiskey in, in uh, 19, 39 and then two years later all that comes off the shelves so for four years we don't have whiskey that we produced on the shelves and further having our uh, competitors especially from canada uh just having more robust sales than we did so world war ii after world war ii is over the distilleries they knew that there was rumblings that we were gonna have uh, conflict in Korea. So they increased production, and uh, as our owner, Max Shapiro says, we've made a lot of mistakes uh, back in the, in the time, uh, but you know, they did them because it made sense back then. So they produced a lot of whiskey, they increased their production because they, they wanted to make enough whiskey so when, they, when the government came back to them, uh, when the Korean conflict, uh, broke out, they would have enough stocks or they would have enough to, to make uh, industrial whiskey for the, for the war effort again and that. But what happened was during the Korean War, the government never came to them. So technology changed a little bit. They didn't need that high proof alcohol. So all these barrels represent all the overproduction that happens. And so in the 1950s and 60s, we never recovered from that. Those blended whiskeys from Canada and Scotland and then the American blended whiskeys like Seagram's 5 blend and Seagram's 7 blend and Kessler and Philadelphia, all those were a little bit, uh, you know, they were, they were selling and much more prevalent. They had more placements than we did. We had to cut our prices. And so that made an image of our whiskey being inferior a lot of a lot of distilleries went out of business 
And this slide here shows uh, the big four. So the big four were really who became so strong. You know, we, we had the, the, the auto companies, we always call them the big three. You know, you had Chrysler, you had Ford, you had GM. But this was the big four. And so you had, you had Seagram's, uh, which was out of Canada, Hiram Walker, also out of Canada. Then you had National Distillers in Kentucky. And then you had Shenley here in Kentucky. And so they represented the majority of the whiskey, American whiskey business. You also had small producers like Heaven Hill that were around. And then they would, uh, in the big four and Heaven Hill, and other healthy distilleries, they started becoming the acquirer of brands as those distilleries went out of business. So Heaven Hill starts acquiring some really cool regional brands, okay? Brands like Rittenhouse Rye out of Pennsylvania that, uh, that is a great uh, rye named after David Rittenhouse, who uh, it was originally called Rittenhouse Square Rye in the late 1930s and in the early 40s, it changed to just Rittenhouse, but it still had the square on there because he, he mapped out the city of Philadelphia, David Rittenhouse. And then uh, we had uh, Pikesville Rye, which actually we acquired years before. Um, it was from Maryland and it was a great Maryland rye uh, that we still have in our portfolio today. Great bourbon brands we acquired over the years of JTS Brown, JW Dant, uh, TW Samuels, uh, Mellow Corn Corn Whiskey out of the Medley Distillery in Owensboro. And they had Cabin Still and Old Fitzgerald from Stitzel Weller that went out of business in the, in the uh, early, uh, early 80s and 90s. So we became the acquirers of brands. And that's why even today we have these little gems in our portfolio that are historical and that are really important in the whiskey world. But some are just regional. They're not all from all over the country. So you, you might see some of these around your area and you might not see others, but we still have them and we still hold them as great gems in our portfolio. And then also during the 60s, two spirits come into uh, to the United States that were never here before that we had to compete. And it was really almost the one-two punch that really sent us to the great liquor store in the sky forever. And that would be vodka and tequila imagine not having vodka remember the monteleone uh, the monteleone cocktail list and spirits list did not have any tequila or vodka in it so here it's just in the 1960s it comes in we have an overproduction of whiskey and that whiskey's getting older if you're on a brand team if you're max shapira in the family and you're wondering what to do with all this whiskey you have what do you think you would have done if you had an overproduction of whiskey and whiskey whiskey's getting older? And at that time, people did not want whiskey over six, seven, or eight years old. So if it got older than that, you know that your consumer really doesn't want it. So what do you think you would have done? And this is slide shows exactly what they did. They put it into collectible decanters. You had these great decanters that, uh, that some of them were made for liquor stores, some of them were, were made for, for uh, events, some of them are just fun. You look at the one in the middle there, that is the I Dream of Genie bottle from, from, uh, uh, the, from the TV show, I Dream of Genie. Um, you got the great old Fitzgerald crystal, diamond crystal decanter. Wow, that's why we put that old Fitzgerald in that same decanter today to show that history. So you either put it into a, a collectible bottle that they might collect it for what it is, or you put it into a beautiful decanter that you can decant other spirits for after that bottle's empty, you can still use it. And notice how they put the ages on there. That one on the right there, that beam, uh, that beam bottle, that says 120 months old. So they didn't want you to know that it was, you know, I gotta do the math, right? So what is that, eight years old? I think it's 12, I think it's 10 years old, 120 months, but it doesn't sound like it's 10 years old. It's 120 months old, right? So they did tell you how old it was and they were varying ages, but that's what they did with all this old whiskey. It's just a fascinating part of history that I love to, uh, to, to tell people about. We also use decanters. We didn't use them as much is uh, is well because it's very expensive to run a, a decanting line, but uh, they we use different crocks and pottery and, and that. And this is a way 
uh, our company and other companies move those products. So a great glimpse into history of what happened there. Also in the 1960s, when uh, bourbon became the distinctive product of the United States, we put down into and added to those laws from 1936 and really defined what whiskey is today, what bourbon, rye, wheat, malt, rye malt whiskey is today, what corn whiskey, what straight whiskey is. Those are on the books today still have those laws and of course bottled and bond still so important and there are the laws for bottled and bond and so it is a fantastic glimpse into history and if you notice um the words it, it doesn't just have to say bottled and bond or bonded as long as it has the word bond on it it can be it's from a domestic distilled spirit on the Monteleone cocktail list, there was a couple Canadian whiskeys that can't be anymore. So we can only we can only uh, rule over our have laws for ourselves. We can't for the rest of them. But it does say that it has to be the same types of spirit, the same class of materials. So I cannot take uh, even though they're made from the same three grains. Uh, Heaven Hill cannot take mellow corn whiskey, rye whiskey and bourbon whiskey and mingle those together they have to stand on their own that's the same class of materials it also has to from the same distilling season from the same distillery stored for at least four years in wooden containers you can even make vodka and gin as it says there but it also must be aged for four years in wooden containers but lined with paraffin so that's why you've never seen a, a bottle and bond gin or bottle and bond vodka still on the books today it has to be uh, reduced in proof by pure water only to 100 degrees. Uh, so 50% so alcohol or 100 proof. And you have to put the real name of the distillery and your distinctive distillery plant number, which is a DSP, Distilled Spirits Plant Number. And so our Heaven Hill is DSP and KY, because that's where our distillery is in Kentucky. And one is our distilling number. If the bottling plan is different, you must put that on. So that is DSP KY31 in Bardstown, where our original distillery and our bottling line still is. So those laws on the books still there, and those laws are what these this list of bottle and bond spirits that are available nationwide. And as you can see here, uh, we have Heaven Hill has the lion's share of bottle and bonds that are available. We have, we have 10, which is amazing. We have Mellow Corn, which is the only bottle and bond corn whiskey that I know of. We have Rye with Rittenhouse Rye. We have two different bourbons with Old Fitzgerald and Heaven Hill and Henry McKenna and J.W. Dant, all that. And different distilleries have different bottle and bonds, but not every distillery. And then, of course, your craft distillers. They're looking at a bottle and bond as a way to legitimize their distillery. So take a look at this list. And if you don't have these spirits behind your bar, you should have every single one of them, not just ours, not just Heaven Hills. I think you should have everybody's. And I think you should put them in just like the Hotel Monteleon did, put them in your own bottle and bond section. How cool would that be to have your own bottle and bond section? I do at my bar here at Burns Corner. I think you should too at your home bar and the bar that you, you work at. So you remember back to the Hotel Monteleone original cocktail list. That's the first, I mean, there's probably a dozen brandy cocktails on their menu. Where did all the brandy cocktails go? I don't see many of them out there anymore. And I'm so excited that Lynn's gonna mix up a cocktail with a, a project that she and I did together and that was Sacred Bond Brandy from Christian Brothers, the only Ball and Bond great brandy out there that I know of. So, uh, Lynn, can't wait to see what you mix up with, with Sacred Bond. I'm so excited to be presenting this cocktail. Um, everything old is new again. You know, before Prohibition, we actually saw a lot of Ball and Bond brandies out there. This project was a collaboration between Bernie and myself, so it is our baby. Um, classic cocktails have come back into fashion. So I'm gonna take a classic cocktail, the Smash, which we most likely would have seen as a brandy cocktail back in the day, put a modern twist with it. Um, but of course, using a newer release of a bottle and bond, uh, sacred bond brandy. 
which is the only, as Bernie mentioned, grape bottled and bond brandy available in the United States. So happy to present my uh, bonded cherry smash. So the amazing thing about bottle and bond cocktails is how they've evolved since 1897. You know, traditionally people expected them with whiskey, actually brandy, bottle and bond products were fairly popular before prohibition and proudly Heaven Hill has been able to resurrect that category of great brandies in the bottle and bond category. So I'm going to take a little something new, which is sacred bond brandy and mirror it with something old, which is a traditional smash cocktail, which your original smashes actually were with brandy. So what we're going to do first is in our tin measure a half ounce of some fresh lemon juice. Because the basis of it is a sour. We're gonna take a half ounce of cane sugar syrup. All this is, is a simple syrup that's made with cane sugar and not bleached white sugar. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take about, oh, five or six leaves of some fresh mint. And we're going to muddle it in this mixture. Adding it right now with the citrus and the sweet will actually allow some extraction of the mint oils, which makes it so unique. And I want to bring in something that's a little modern technique and modern ingredients because we're talking about the evolution of bottled and bond, particularly in cocktails. And jams and jellies are a phenomenal way for you to allow fresh flavor into a cocktail, whether it's in the season or out of the season. So I'm just gonna take two healthy bar spoons of some Michigan cherry jam that I was able to get this year. And I stir that in with the mint and the lemon and the simple, just allowing that jam to melt down. And then we're gonna take two ounces uh, sacred bond bottle and bond brandy now this is a smash so one of the things that I went and did ahead of time was take some ice put it in a Lewis bag smash it up put it in my rocks glass so that's all ready to go now we're gonna ice our cocktail down and then of course the superpower shake I can feel the chill and the dilution just by feeling the temperature change on the exterior of the tin. Put my strainer on and slowly strain this cocktail into our glass. Now, I personally like a more rustic cocktail, so I don't do the double strain. So I like the bits of mint and the bits of jelly and the little bits of pulp that are left in there. But you always want to make sure that you finish it with a beautiful and fine garnish. So we've got some fresh mint. Delicately just discipline that herb. Put it on top. I think we can add a little more mint to the top to make it extra fancy. And there you have a bonded brandy cherry smash. Well, thanks for joining us on this bonded journey as we learned the, uh, why the Bottle and Bond Act came to be uh, through the evolution of how bonded whiskeys and bonded spirits made its way and how it lost its way uh, in prohibition, but still kept alive through medicinal whiskeys. And then after prohibition and how the uh, decades passed almost sent Bottle and Bond whiskeys and American whiskey to the great liquor store in the sky, as Max Shapira, our owner and president, says. And then how it came back into the forefront with your help. Uh, and I like to say with Heaven Hill's help, too, because we have so many Bottle and Bonds. And, uh, and, and the passion that I have and you all have and Lynn has for Bottle and Bond uh, spirits. So uh, thank you so much. And I hope to see you in person very soon. So stay bonded. I just want to echo what Bernie said. Um, since 1897, this category of bottle and bond 
has been so important to the, not only history of whiskey, but the history of American spirits. And to see its evolution throughout the years has just been amazing. When I first got on the craft side about 15 years ago, you would rarely see a bottle and bond product behind the bar, let alone a bartender using it to create fantastic cocktails. But I've so enjoyed over the years watching bartenders embrace this category, understand this category, utilizing this category. We know that higher proof spirits sing really beautifully in cocktails. And so there are so many amazing cocktail applications for a bottled and bond products. Um, I'm excited to see all of the smaller producers out there who are releasing their own bottle and bonds, um, whether it's only regionally available for many of them. I think it just speaks to the category and how amazing this category. And I think we're gonna see great things in the future for the bottle and bond category. Uh, so missing you all in person this year, hoping we can gather next year. And as Bernie says, cheers and stay bonded. <laughs>